Good evening to all of you on behalf of the Rana Foundation, which organizes this annual <coughs> memorial lecture series in collaboration with the India Habitat Center. We organize eight memorial lectures, and they are for Habib Tanvi, Kumar Gandhar, Mani Kaul, V.S. Gaitonde, Daya Krishna, Agge, Charles Korea, and K. Richard Mahapath. And I can tell you it's very difficult to get eight speakers in a year. And on some of the, some of the subjects, some of the themes, for instance, K. Richard Mahapath, uh, memorial lecture, we find it very difficult to locate persons. Anyway, so we are very grateful that you came here. Before Ashish Rajya Dhaksh, there have been Kumar Shahani delivered the first Manikor Memorial Lecture, followed by JNU Professor, followed by Dilip Padgamkar. And now this is the fourth Memorial Lecture. To this audience, Ashish Rajya Dhaksh knows I mean, needs no introduction. Uh, he is a well-known figure in the world of visual arts and cinema. Uh, a couple of years ago, he edited essays of Kumar Shani, which we in the Raza Foundation had the opportunity of partly supporting the publication of, I hope the English right, prepositions at the end. Uh, and now he is going to, although these lectures are memorial lectures, there is no obligation on the part of the <coughs> lecturer to speak about the person uh, after whom the lecture has been instituted. But happily, Ashish has chosen to speak about <coughs> Manikal's <coughs> cinema reflections from the very deep surface, money calls when God turn. Uh, the rule of the game is, if there is a rule at all, this is a rather chaotic game anyway, that he will speak for about an hour and show something, also you want to show some clips and all, and then there will be some time for the audience to offer brief comments and ask sharp questions. We are not looking for your opinion so much. Uh, there are other fora where you can give your opinion. Here, your comment on the lecture, and if there is a question or a clarification that you need to ask, that. So, there you are, Ashish Adhyatyak. You can keep it here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ashokji. Uh, it's, it's quite an experience, I think, to, uh, first of all, apart from everything else, to speak about Manikal in a context where so many people know him or knew him uh, so well. So uh, we're really talking about someone whom many of us knew well. And I've, as a result, that's something which I don't normally do, which is, for example, when writing about Kumar, I, I, I systematically make two distinctions that Kumar, my friend, and, and Shahani, about whom I write. Um, whereas here, I'm actually writing about money and not call. Uh, so there is that rather specific personal aspect to, to this. Um, I'm going to try and finish this in an hour. Uh, so that's the rule, and I, I will adhere to it. Um, and, and for that reason, I'm going to also summarize some of what I, what I have said. Uh, I just want to begin with what I consider to be my primary preoccupation here. And I just quickly mention it in the, in the context of, a, of an, actually an anecdote. Some years ago, uh, Ravi Vasudevan had Thomas L. Sasser in uh, CSDS uh, speaking as <coughs> part of the CSDS 50th anniversary lectures. And El Sasser actually came up with an interesting hypothetical or fictional story between uh, a film historian and an art museum person where the art museum says to film that, look, you had the entire 20th century to get your act together. You bungled it. Okay? Now let us, the art museum, come and tell you how it's done. Uh, and as a result, film, celluloid film, 
has now gradually entered the art museum with some difficulty. But actually what happened was, the film guy says to the art museum, art museum, you did not realize through the entire history of the 20th century modernism, what was the elephant in the room. In the 20th century, the art museum systematically excluded cinema. So you have bungled. <laughs> now let us deal with the problem correctly. Uh, I am primarily interested in this problem of the possible challenges that the cinema presents to the art museum and the art museum to cinema. And in this I am specifically concerned not so much with moving image material that's produced on <laughs> post celluloid or digital platforms, but the rather specific technical aesthetic challenge presented by what was made originally on celluloid and is now to be translated, transformed, modified, some might say mutilated, um, as it enters the art museum. Uh, I want to say this also because I am a little distressed by the fact that, uh, just for example, uh, Akbar Padamsi's SYZYGY was shown in very poor quality video in, uh, in the Kochi Biennale and more recently other artists have actually simply sort of shown low end, you know, uh, um, DVD versions of what used to be celluloid films without any real understanding of what constitutes the process of transformation. Um, what this is, is going to be a set of <coughs> speculations on what celluloid film can look like in an art museum. Uh, more specifically, it is in the context of uh, uh, an opportunity that I had earlier this year um, at the Jawahar Gala Kendra, courtesy Pooja Sood, who is here, there. Um, to show money call in the Jawahar Kala Kendra in a form that is, some might say, quite removed from how he had made it. But because it was money, one had an idea that he might have actually supported this endeavor. And it is actually reflection of speculations that come out from that particular experience that I'm going to talk about. Um, so, here we go. The last works, writing amateur video. It was in early 2011 that I had my last long conversation with Manikal. We spoke over the phone. I had hoped to drop by and see him in Gurgaon, but he said he wasn't feeling very well and he wasn't up to meeting. Nevertheless, as often happened with Mani, he warmed up to the conversation and we ended up by having a rather long talk. As we spoke on the phone, uh, an old theme developed a new twist. For we returned yet again to something that had been obsessing our conversations ever since 2005 when I had first visited him in Rotterdam. <coughs> I had heard, I, I visited him then because I had heard that he had made, you might say, home movies using low-end handicap, handicaps and other such equipment. And the only way to see that was to go and visit him, or so I thought but it proved to be harder than that. He seemed curiously reluctant to show me this new work, even attempting to cancel a screening that I had scheduled. For all that, Mani was grateful, it seemed to me, that I had come and, and, uh, and wanted to meet him and wanted to see them, and discussed at some considerable length how he had gone about making them. He had, he said, learned the rudiments of Final Cut Pro, which was the technology that was still new at that point of time, and which was now on his MacBook, attached to an external 500 gigabyte hard disk. With these, he edited his own footage, choosing to do his work while lying down on a bed. This is, this is important. As he edited, Mani chanced upon a discovery, he said. He found that moving his mouse while in a semi-reclining posture appeared akin to drawing. And so, even as Mani edited, he began sketching began making figures that morphed into natural shapes using extremely light pencils also made in the same reclining pose. He showed me some of those sketches which I recall as very delicate and vulnerable made with faint near invisible lines. Now in 2011, as we spoke on the phone, although terminally ill, he described with characteristic energy yet another activity that seemed to have gripped him. He had begun, he said, to record sounds on his mobile phone as he lay beside the window. These were apparently incidental sounds, and he now wondered aloud as to whether he might edit them into a work of sound art. This was in 2011. 
I suggested to him that if he was indeed serious, maybe we could get him a rather more sophisticated sound recorder. I offered to speak to Vikram Zoglekar about it. He agreed that this might be done, but almost immediately added that the sound that he was actually recording on his mobile was not so bad, and that he had gotten rather attached to what he was doing. It all seemed like I'd heard it before. I remembered how enthusiastically he had described his handicam work, despite his evident reluctance to show it to me, and I wondered now what might be the fate of this proposed sound work. Was he serious about what he was doing, or was it just a momentary passing attraction? If he did make, some, make something of the sound work, would he even show it to me? Over the last two years, I mean, between 2015, 16, 17, let's say, three years, thanks to various of Mani's friends and students, both here and in Holland, what, what's happened is that we've gradually pieced together a fair bit of this miscellaneous work uh, that he has that obsessed him in the last years of his life, and it does seem that there might well be a considerable body of it. Some of this work is actually being shown on, on, on European television, for example. There's an astonishing film called, believe it or not, Danish Girls Show Everything. Uh, there was films like uh, I Am No Other or The Monkey's Raincoat, which appeared to be complete, except that he did not show them to anyone consciously, to my knowledge. I don't think they were ever publicly shown. There were things that he's done for Ossians, for example, a signature film that he did. There are, for example, then the, the uh, home movies that he made on his mobile phone, which Gurvinder Singh has put together in a, in a uh, DVD called Riyaz, which were clearly not intended to be shown to anybody. There were the sketches I'm talking about, which I don't know what has happened to. Um, there are the poems, I think 18 poems that he wrote in English, which have been designed into a book by, uh, by Gurvinder Singh, which have not been published. All of this material, this last years of his life material, produces a conundrum. Is it important or is it not? Should it now be recognized as part of the master's late style? Or was it mere amateur dabbling? There remains the fact that money was at best personally ambiguous about putting this in the public arena. While the artist's personal view on such matters may not necessarily be the most relevant or the most accurate, the question remained, even as he dabbled with low-end sound technology, his handicam, his mobile, and his pencil, had he perchance lost interest at this point of time in art making as an end product? Was the final work, whether on paper, video, or sound, effectively unimportant, irrelevant, perhaps even unnecessary to be, to be concluded, and, and you know, uh, emphasizing a process that he was exploring, which we must now excavate? A few further thoughts came to my mind that day. Was money even making any distinction anymore between these different activities of recording, editing, and drawing? Or were all of these somewhere in his mind variations of the same activity? There might be another mundane reason for thinking of them as such, because digital content, for example, is the same whether it's sound, picture, and you know all that, it's just a file on your computer. But did he have maybe some rather less mundane reason for thinking of them as such, for allowing for this conjuncture? Did money have, for example, Another understanding of digital convergence, perhaps even a new role there for both poetry and pencil on paper drawing. And then I had what I thought was a profound thought. It seemed to me that money was actually bringing all these activities together and that they were indeed variants of a parent activity, one that might perhaps be described through the metaphor of writing. My hand, I quote money here, my hand resting on a pillow, a pen in my hand, and the sleep spreading to my fingers as if I'm about to drift off, says he in a cloven space. My mind has become absolutely fluid, and now, slowly, words begin to enter my curiosity. They make a sequence, coming and going. What is the meaning of the sequence? What could be hidden in this arrangement of words? Whatever it might be, just keep writing. Later, I will see what has happened. Now, writing is metaphor, uh, especially <coughs> writing as a means of you know, with which you drift off as sleep spreads into his fingers and his mind becomes fluid and words enter his curiosity as many evocations from Freud's uh, mystic writing pad to Andre Breton's automatism. But Money clearly is not a surrealist. He used to enjoy recounting the story of how Freud had once <laughs> chided the surrealists for their misplaced understanding of consciousness. Perhaps another association closer to home might well be the doodles of another Rabindranath in the last years of his life. I suspect, however, 
that if we are indeed looking at genealogies, then the relevant legacy might well be a rather different realist interpretation um, or alternative to the perception of writing a cinematic metaphor given, and this is something I've been very interested in, the importance of realism in Mani's work. And that's something that I want to talk about a little bit later. In 1924, Jean Cocteau had said, people don't draw, they unravel their handwriting and then tie it up again, but differently. 20 years later, after the war ended, Jean Cocteau actually took part, along with André Bazin and Alexander Astruc, in this project called Objective 49, uh, 40, 49, uh, 48 actually, later on Objective 49. And in 1948, perhaps in the context of this initiative, Alexander Astruc actually had come up with the idea of writing with a camera. He spoke about it as a kind of cinema that would gradually break free from the tyranny of what is visual, from the image for its own sake, from the immediate and concrete demands of the narrative, to become a means of writing just as flexible and as subtle as written language. This art uh, of cinema, says Astruc, although blessed with an enormous potential, is an easy prey to prejudice. It cannot go on forever plowing the same field of realism and social <coughs> fantasy which has been bequeathed to it by the popular novel. It can tackle any subject, any genre. The most philosophical mediations on human production, psychology, metaphysics, ideas and fashions lie within the cinema's province. I will even go so far as to say that contemporary ideas and philosophies of life are such that only the cinema can do justice to them. Commenting later, uh, continuing the surrealism connection, on a statement by Maurice Nadeau, the authoritative historian of surrealism, that if Descartes had lived today, he would write novels. Alexander Astrup now says that had Descartes lived today, he would have shut himself up in his bedroom with a 16 millimeter camera and some film and would be writing his philosophy on film for his discourse on method would today be of a such a kind that only the cinema would express it satisfactorily. I think Mani would have liked that idea. What's happened, however, is that there is a curious twist to this tale. Jean Cocteau, uh, just about the same time as 1948, as, uh, as when he, um, you know, uh, was, Astruc was writing this, made a statement apparently that the cinema, which he described as a petrified fountain of thought, would only become an idea, an art, when its materials become as inexpensive as pencil and paper. Now this has been a curious history, uh, I will just quickly summarize this, where it seems as though in speaking of cinema becoming as cheap as pencil and paper, he wrote an early ad for the iPhone. Um, you know, we all know that the iPhone itself has, uh, along with of course the extraordinary capacities it now has to come up with 4K resolution and near professional uh, uh, screening um, uh, projection facilities, uh, projection uh, um, quality. Um, there has also been, you know, this, 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 this consistent effort <coughs> on the part of Apple, um, as you can see in Steve Jobs' presentations, to create an avant-garde legacy for this technology, as you will see in his constant reference to, um, you know, um, all kinds of artists um, um, and, 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 and musicians and so on. I want to suggest that there is a misreading of this Cocteau statement because this is actually something increasingly referred to in the context of digital technology, that film has become so cheap that anyone can make a film. I want to suggest here, and I am just summarizing the statement, that what Cocteau was speaking about is something quite different. He was speaking really about an error, uh, um, about an error from some syncope, from some chance encounter between the attention and inattention of its author, something he wrote about in 1947 in the book, The Difficulty of Being, and that the kind of shift that has taken place from écriture, <coughs> that is writing, to it being cheap, is actually a slippage which, are, which is of, of, of immense importance uh, and indeed in this particular slippage in this kind of misreading that we now have of what Cocteau probably meant may lie actually a, a kind of a covert history of uh, a tradition of the avant-garde which I think we can now talk about. Perhaps the way to read Cocteau's statement is to use his own error against the statement itself. Uh, this section is called Sankramita, the semiotic trace, erasure, and the condition of wakefulness. Four decades before his digital doodles, Manikal had begun with a rather conventional writing experiment. 
Penny made Uski Roti, it's of some interest. Uh, he actually collaborated with Mohan Rakesh to do this. And it seems that Mohan Rakesh and he spent quite a bit of time writing up the screenplay of that film. Having written up the screenplay of that film, Mani now claims that he put the screenplay completely aside and made the film with no screenplay at all in his mind. Over the years, it seems to me that as he grew and dragged, opened up his practice to the diverse possibilities of error, such erasure would grow into an entire methodology where he would undertake an activity that cost time, money, and enormous energy only to rub it out in order to enable the next. My shooting, he famously declares on Cloven Space, is absolutely unrelated to the script, the editing is absolutely unrelated to the footage, and the sound is not related to the material. We are at a crucial stage now in this inquiry that I'm making. And I want to just read this portion because actually this is the key part of what I'm going to get at. I shall now condense the material from various sources to summarize an argument that I believe is consistently in evidence in his films all the way from Uski Roti through to these doodles. I begin with the following question, not why such sequel erasures happen, you know, this constant sort of erasure of the next stage erasing the previous, but really what is retained as the filmic process moves from erasure to erasure. Let's say you begin with a tree. Okay? This is a standard example and one used to love giving this example of the tree. In the script, you only have the word tree. So when, my, when Mohan Rakesh wrote it, he must have simply written a tree. Or he might have described, say, a banyan tree or some other kind of tree in the, in the script. But it's still words. You then go to your location and discover your tree. So then it becomes this particular tree. This particular actor. No longer abstracted. So far, so good. This much we can follow. But then the first major complication arises. This particular tree, having supposedly discovered its specific treeness through the shot that is taken of it, is immediately to be denuded of key aspects of its specificity. And here is where Mani's intense engagement with realism now comes in. For this tree is now that is now before us did not come from anywhere. We all, all that we know of it is that it's before us. We must, when he sternly tells us, renounce the notion that beings and objects appear from somewhere. The only thing that's important is the space that extends and returns to itself. The tree itself has been thus effectively erased by the space of our encounter with it, which is what the shot has set up. An even bigger problem now arises. A shot any shot, if it doesn't keep whatever it records under some kind of control, can apparently trigger off all kinds of uncontrolled associations, even fantasies. And this is the basis of horror movies, uh, that you know, the fact of the shot being unable to contain what it's supposedly trying to capture. A problem now arises that Mani says is unique to cinema, and it is this. The social object, let us say our tree, is directly situated in society and is thus already significant and complex. In the cinema, the tree appears, unlike, say, in a painting, as a pre-socialized, pre-symbolized entity. Realism has done its work before the camera has got there. The cinema is now having to face, uh, is faced with having to conduct a total inversion of traditional aesthetic methods. For unlike art that signifies, which is supposedly one of the roles of art, the cinema now has to equally de-signify. The tree, pre-imbued with whatever significance it possesses, must now exist as what it is, no less, but also no more. It is not to be made significant anymore. This is Mani speaking. A tree, I quote him now, a tree will stand for itself in front of a camera and nothing more unless the filmmaker decides to invest an idea into the tree. But this is a bad thing to do. He doesn't like that. For such an idea of investing an idea into the tree is above all a way of denaturing that tree. The cinematic image of the tree is not more than a pre-verbal sensation. This is a quotation of Gilles Deleuze that he, that he liked. Uh, it is a sign that is utterable, but not an utterance yet. The very tree that stands for itself will begin to reveal its own unique meaning when it finds a suitable position in a given set of standing for themselves images. 
this is all extremely crucial because all of this was going to be featuring in this installation that we, we did in, Jaip in Jaipur here. Let us now take stock of where we are. Potentially utterable, but not yet an utterance. Mani's tree is now speaking schematically, standing for itself as neither realist nor non-realist, but somewhere in between. It is using Mani's term, derived from Deleuze, no more than a pre-verbal sensation. The significance of what is captured can only be maintained through a delicate balance of some kind, for investing an idea into the tree is a way of denaturing the tree, and this is not to be allowed. I suggest here, and this is my key point really, that Mani's tree now stands for a semiotic trace of some kind. Okay, the semiotic trace is something I'm going to explore a little bit more. Our purpose shall now be to identify this elusive trace and to track its career through the different stages of the filmic process. For, for one, although it seems to exist objectively in the shot, it is in fact created with a rather specific spectatorial condition. Such a condition Mani describes as consciousness. But we have to recognize that he's meaning it in a certain way. And indeed, he also at, at some points establishes that it's not exactly consciousness, but another term called wakefulness that he wants to, wants to talk about here. The main thing about the cinema is that although different stages in the production process, from the script to the shooting to the editing to the post-production and so on, um, all the different stages in the production process produce different conditions of consciousness. In the actual practice of watching a film, these stages exist simultaneously. So this some kamikta is, is important. This idea of simultaneity then becomes a very crucial concept for, for money. When you make a film, you shoot in a fully conscious state. But when you edit, you edit in a condition that is closer to dream work because how we join time, how we connect spaces, cutting in a way that severs the time-space link that was established by the shooting, all this happens in the editing. In contrast, the film viewing experience coalesces all of this, these different stages, into a knot, as he has it. The mind, having no location other than its awareness that it exists, is defined by the simultaneity of these different stages. Such a knot, a condition of different stages of the waking condition, so to say, has technical consequences for him. This is, I think, important. We know well, says Mani, how Western aesthetics have the has the extraordinary ability to work with harmony, most directly experienced, of course, in the ability of different musical instruments to play together at once. It cannot be, however, says Mani, that such simultaneity does not exist in Indian art. You know, he says it has to have existed. Otherwise, how, for example, did Mughal miniaturists distinguish between surface and depth? What we need to do, he now argues, extrapolating from miniature painting practice, and this was a big thing for him, is to view foreground, middle ground, and depth as attributed different states of awakeness or different states of consciousness. It is such a simultaneity that the cinema, he says, can graphically realize. I'm, I'm jumping here. It is therefore, now let me propose, such a trace that constitutes the kernel of his understanding of the metaphor of writing. Without back to the writing um, question. It is like our tree, a signifier that is within language, but not a part of the symbolic order. I think this is, this is uh, I think a key argument here. It is not so either because money refuses to let it be so, or because it is in his hands expelled from it. In her classic text, Black Sun, Depression and Melancholia, Julia Kristeva speaks of an astonishingly similar condition that she names asymbolia. It's a phrase that she has, asymbolia. It is a condition where the signifying trace exists within language but does not lend itself easily to symbolization. Where the thing, this is her phrase, where the thing for which the object stands, stands in becomes also a source of profound melancholy interrupting the capacity of the object to become properly symbolic. How can one approach the place I am referring to, I have referred to, she asks. Sublimation is an attempt to do so through melody, rhythm, semantic polyvalency, the so-called poetic form, which decomposes and recomposes signs, is the sole container seemingly able to secure an uncertain but adequate hold over the thing. This now was a set of ideas with which we came uh, to 
to uh, Jaipur. Can I put uh, a light for something? Can we reduce the light slightly? Huh? Thank you very much. All we come. Um, sometime in uh, uh, late 2011, a few months after Mani passed away, um, I worked on an exhibition in uh, uh, Guangzhou where uh, for the first time I showed Mani Call in an art space. Um, this was shown along with Andri Singh Kaleka and uh, what we did was we showed three of Mani's films, uh, Siddheshwari, Drupad and Mati Manas in an, in, a, in an installation context allowing people to walk in and walk out. But we did nothing very much to the film. There's a whole series of further arguments which, I can, which I'm not going to go into about how we did, what we did and so on. Um, it's, it's actually the book of Ranbir Kadeka that's coming out and I have contributed an essay to that where I've gone some length into the technical decisions and choices that, that we made. Um, but the specific question really is why do this? Uh, why, would, why would I... Uh, see, unlike Ranbir Kadeka, who uh, was being shown in a way that he was meant to be shown. In other words, the art that he made was shown in the way that it was intended. Mani Kaur had never intended for the cinema to be shown like this. Uh, it was to be shown in an auditorium. I mean, it should be shown to an audience that was seated in one direction and looking at, at a screen. Why do this? To me, a larger issue hangs on this decision. Even if the art museum today expands its scope and intention, there is a parallel fact. The moving image has for the past decade or so moved beyond the cinema. The death of cellular technology has not only been a technological death, but also it seems the death of an entire apparatus for engaging with the moving image. What do we use now, I wondered, what if we use the several new means available in the display of video art, and, and we do have a very advanced tradition of video art here, to rediscover what used to be celluloid in another space? Could the linearity of single channel projection to a seated <coughs> audience all pointing in a single direction, herded into a movie theater, space clearly designed for a mass public, be replaced by the freedoms of mobile spectators and multi-channel productions, projections. On the other hand, of course, this was not born video. This was born celluloid. And what we had were video versions, copies, you might say, of originals. So these were actually, and one had to recognize that these were copies uh, could the edgy, in-your-face materiality that celluloid once possessed be reconstructed in the art museum by other means? Might the cinema now have something to say to, and even who knows, learn from this new post-celluloid domain? Could bringing money together with his old friend Ranbir allow us to transit celluloid film into a newer and perhaps friendlier space than the average movie theater? Could the cinema find new lease of life in the art museum? Uh, there's a whole section here where I've actually tracked a little bit about Mani's origins and, and the connections with uh, visual arts. I think Kumar is here and Kumar would have uh, a similar history. And the specific example is the vision exchange workshop that Akbar Padamsi had put together, which amongst other things was also, I think, the first film Kumar made since after he came back from France and Mani made Duvida there. And it's so extremely important for me, and I won't go into that, that there was a cinematic avant-garde that existed in Bombay at that point of time in the films of S.N.S. Shastri, Sukhdev, and Pramod Pati, which clearly were not of interest to uh, Mani Kumar or the artists of the Vision Exchange Workshop, who might well have argued that the really important avant-garde work, cinematic work, there was Akbar Padamsi's SYZYGY than anything cinematic. So there was actually something tempting about reconstructing money as actually an artist who worked in celluloid rather than as a filmmaker and thus you know, find a way by which he might have imagined himself as being in an art museum, albeit posthumously. This was a tempting thought. But then there was the brute fact of the material in our face. And this brute fact was, I'll just summarize the next section. Uh, it was that you know, we were saying, look, celluloid really has to be shown as celluloid in the art museum. And so went to uh, Shai Heredia, who had shown 16 mil in the art museum in the Experimenta. Uh, in the Experimenta. Uh, and, and she was saying, forget it. There's no way you want to be able to do this. Because if you show it celluloid in a loop, you're going to burn up a celluloid print, roughly speaking, once every four days. And this means that you'd have so many prints and, and, and so on and so forth. But even as we did all this, Piyush Shah, the cinematographer of Siddheshwari, um, 
I took him along to films division and he took uh, a long look over, over an entire day at the negatives of Siddheshwari Dhrupad and Arrival and pronounced those materials dead. He said that unless technology of a kind that we don't have in India and cost of a kind that is impossible, there's no way that that celluloid could be, could be rescued. So we actually were faced with a situation of, a, of an erasure of a complete kind. So the cellular material was no longer available to us. Piyush concluded that um, the best material, especially Siddheshwari, which was his film that he had shot and which was in the worst condition actually, the best material that we actually had were digibeaters that Films Division had made because although the digibeaters weren't good, they at least were from the original material. Right? So, so there was that, that, that possibility and he then did something which I think is incredibly crucial and I'll just take a minute to show you that clip. Uh, to uh, take the Siddheshwari material and reconstruct it more or less on his own computer. Now, uh, given the fact that Piyush is a cinematographer uh, and knows something of cinematography, there was no way that there was no way that, he, that this was a justifiable act and yet I think it was an extremely crucial act that he um, that he attempted. Can I have sound? What's interesting is what's interesting is that yeah, can, you, can you pause? Sorry, I, I can pause here. Yeah. What's interesting is that a lot of the errors that you now have are errors that were introduced by the DG beta. So this extraordinary blue that you get on the right hand side is something he couldn't do anything about. Um, what I want to suggest here is that what Piyush did was not do an act of conservation or a restoration. What he did was an act of translation. This is important for me. What he did was he took a celluloid film and translated it into video. Like you might take a Hindi poem and translate it into Malayalam. <laughs> you know? uh, it's not the original. Uh, he was extremely unhappy, uncomfortable about what he did. Um, even now he says that he's full of self-doubt. Even now he says we should perhaps never have done this. Nevertheless. I think it seemed that in this particular activity, he was aided by money for in his work, for his work did arguably bear some degree of continuity to the original film experiment in the film shooting itself. They had broken a number of rules, says Piyush. Uh, that if money told him, ye lens sahi hai, then I would accept it. They did these things because they were technically wrong, but such as working with heavily underexposed shots, mainly because they ran out of time and were still shooting and, and so on. Uh, so in any case, the point is he did this thing which I think became an interesting clue to us in how to now proceed. Um, earlier this year, um, I was uh, very privileged to have revisited this material and uh, to do something very much more ambitious in the Jawahar Kala Kendra. Um, it seemed that Piyush's experiment did give us a way forward because what we now did was to have a situation where we would no longer show the film but do something like this. We actually took money calls Uski Roti and uh, a young filmmaker Piyush Kashyap spent a huge amount of time to convert it into a five channel video work titled Data. Two of the works that we did, one was Data, uh, which transformed Uski Roti into this work, and Iti, a three-channel assemblage of several of Mani's films, uh, Satesh Urta Admi, Arrival, Siddheshwari, Dhrupad, and Mati Manas, to which we then added I Am No Other and A Monkey's Raincoat, were, uh, were put in this, in this format. And um, we then had an eight-channel sound installation by Vikram Zoglekar titled Hawa Me Gaat, which put several of Mani's film soundtracks assembled into uh, a software platform that kept creating random configurations between over a hundred sound pieces working with a set of affinities. It is uh, the second of these three works that we actually commissioned at the Jawahar Kala Kendra uh, that I want to specifically talk about here. For it is with this work that I think we were able to take to the furthest point that I am aware of, um, the exploration that I am trying to describe. 
it was installed in the central well of the main Jawaharlal Kendra. This was a cavernous space with a 40 foot ceiling, visible not only from the ground, but also from um, the different levels as you walked up to the first floor and then through the glass window, as you can see from, from, from above, um, that looked out into a garden. From there you could also see out from in, but also as you walked around, you could look in from an outdoor ramp that came down. It was a space that was literally in the round, inside out. The installation itself, designed by Mark Prime, was a complicated technical process. With large acrylic screens bolted to the wires that came down from the screening, from the ceiling, mounted with complex scaffolding. The acrylic backed with a thin white coating, allowed for further projections to be viewed from all sides. So you could actually walk around the work and see it from behind, see it from outside, see it from above. In turn, as the sun set, the reflections of the videos on the walls became increasingly prominent. Its soundtrack in stereo and mixed by old time money call collaborator Madhu Apsara played over four speakers from behind the screens. The acrylic screens with their white backing created a kind of iridescent, slightly smoky effect where you could walk both round and through and see in reflection from different levels both inside and outside the space. As we populated images of this kind on walls, so these are actually on walls, on reflection to be, you know, see what sort of multiple layers there. A third figure entered the fray. I thought that this was an exhibition about two artists, Mani Kaul and Ranbir Kaleka. It turned out to be an exhibition of three artists, Mani Kaul, Ranbir Kaleka and Charles Correa. This, uh, this is of course Jawar Kalakendra, Charles Correa's famous building. The towering figure of Korea in the form of this building. Our very deep surface was now to find itself in deep conversation with another kind of modernist representation. These walls and surfaces were not only spaces for images, but included images themselves, as you can see with the Krishna there. From, uh, I quote Kaivan Mehta on the, this particular building, from tantric drawing as wall mural to a larger than life Krishna image, to playing with the shadow patterns of a pergola onto a curved and glazed wall in the Guru Graha. To Kaivan Mehta, who has written about this particular building, the entire key to this building was in the way that it represents space visually, rather than representing space architecturally. Uh, on the way moving from properly architectural space to space founded on the juxtaposition of images uh, as its properly as its aesthetic format, one whose spaces repeatedly produce multiple two-dimensional surfaces that produce an image and a frame. Absence was a direct possibility in such a space. We recalled at this point of time Mani's fascination with the idea of absence, or what he would call the you know the the, the transformation of the Varjit Swar. Uh, as a note that must be seen as a vivadi, um, that is basically it's the, not the vadi sambadi but the vivadi, um, the absent that is in dialogue with that which is actually presented. We realize now that this trace was actually nameable. It was, for example, the rain shot in uh, Siddheshwari of the child Siddhi or to the unit of sound, the fluttering of pigeons that say money would inexplicably drop into the soundtrack as Vikram Joglekar testified uh, into an otherwise coherent soundscape, sometimes even sitting on top of dialogue, something that he explored in his, in his installation. And it was now this entire installation of Iti dropped into the armature of Charles Correa's building. Um, this section is called Melancholy and the Speaking Self. I cannot claim that the result was entirely pre-planned. Uh, not make any claims of what exactly was achieved, and this is unusual for me because that's supposedly my business. This is, this is a bit of a translation for me. What I can do here is to outline some of the concerns that informed both the making of this three-channel work and the specific installation. Here's what I think we tried to do. Okay, it's just a thought, it's not, it's not uh, uh, anything more than that. In attempting 
what I'm calling the translation in the Pew Shah sense of the term, the translation of cellular into video, attempting thus to forge ways of entering the inner logics of the works, what we now tried to do was to follow the same process through which Mani had taken his semiotic trace. This is, uh, I think, a, a, an organizational logic that we attempted. I have defined this trace as existing within language but outside the symbolic, and further proposed that such a form apparently lay within a sequence of erasures. Yeah, this was the point I made earlier. What we now needed to do was to retrace the sequel erasures structure through which he had taken his recorded traces and to assemble a simultaneity, this samkramitata, uh, which that was now not sorry that was now not from film from one film alone, but put together with a, a range of films that that he had assembled. So we actually um, combined all, all of these films together. The story was this. The key examples for such a trace would be decided come from, let me suggest, for want of a better phrase, a de-individuated idea of a speaking self. This is, I think, an important idea, and I'll say a little more about it. Such a self would now be the many voices that narrate Mukti Bodh's legendary 1964 epic poem, Andhere Mein, in Satya Se these would be the backbone of our work. But we would also find this trace in the voice of Siddheshwari, perhaps in the artists in the Riggs Academy, on the right hand side, which is where he made this work. And to this, we would add his own condition described in I am no other as similar to grass, as something that grows anywhere. The sequencing of the voices as different channels worked together to pick in picture and sound produced something that I'm suggesting has a resemblance to what Roland Barth once called a degree zero of writing. A condition of thought that stands out against a backcloth of words as an écriture that has passed through the stages of a progressive solidification to ultimately reach a form that could no longer find purity anywhere but in the absence of all signs. But Andhere Me, and uh, Ashok Vajpayee's work in Andhere Me, and that, that extraordinary book, uh, and the translation by, by, by Krishna Baldev Ved, was something that became a bit of a Bible for us, and I engaged with it in a way that I hadn't done before. Andhere Me is, of course, no instance of writing degree zero. If anything, in its sheer excess, moving from expressionism to interior monologue, from stream of consciousness to political inquiry, it is in every way its very opposite. Here, unlike most forms that money would sift through and mediate in order to find his trace, what we have is him engaging with a classic work of modernism, a work that moves from subjective angst to rage. I'm sure there are many people in this room who know Andhere Me from cover to cover. <laughs> uh, moves from subjective angst to rage, from naked fear to an epiphanic discovery. Money's treatment of Mukti Bodh in Satir, in, in uh, and Andhere Me, in particular, had we no caused much argument at that point of time and confrontation with political groups who supported Mukti Bodh and disliked the film. That confrontation would itself now be of significance, for we would now see Mani bringing some key modernist concerns, uh, such as those of political consciousness, into filmmaking preoccupations that came from a very different trajectory for comprehending consciousness. The most quintessentially classic of all of modernism's worries, the possibility of two different definitions of consciousness, one interior, subject of psychoanalysis, articulated through some variant of existentialism, one exterior, taken from politics, the two apparently incommensurate, and thus a source of much anxiety for a poet like Mukti Bodh, and indeed for a lot of our political poets who were extremely concerned with an idea of selfhood and, and an external struggle. It's like almost it's like the, the core crisis um, of, 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 of uh, modernist thought. Um, this entire problem appeared to be one for which Mani now proposed to find a specific cinematic resolution in the direct engagement with this that Satar has become, as was famously able to pull off. An intensity of engagement with writing such as cinema has certainly never seen before in India at least. Uh, the specific filmic example with which he attempted to realize such a theory of, the, of cinema was actually a very different work to Satya, superficially speaking, Marty Manas, for which too, like Satya, there is no generic precedent in Indian cinema. A free-flowing combination, and uh, Marty Manas is that, 
a free film combination of history, anthropology, dream, <laughs> fantasy, storytelling, and epiphany, Marty Manas, substantially conceived by Kamal Swaroop, who has been inadequately credited uh, for his contribution to that particular film, combines public and private history, legend and tall tales, local practices and beliefs, precisely as a simultaneity of different registers of consciousness. Interweaving such a film into Satay, so using Satay modernism, if you like, or Satay's kind of Bhukti Bodh voice in that particular film with a series of voices from Om Puri's to, to Mani's own, uh, and putting Mahdi Panas, if you like, on top of it. And finally, the digital experiments, using both the concepts of simultaneity and depth as a technical means to do so, opened up a whole series of subterranean connections for us. Now, uh, this is something that Mani has himself talked about in Scene from Nowhere. Uh, I don't want to go into it, but I do want to suggest that what we now get is, as, as I suggested in Cocteau, that in looking at his argument about writing being as uh, uh, filmmaking being as cheap as writing, and finding in the misreading of that statement a kind of a covert history of the avant-garde, I suspect that here too we're actually finding a covert history of modernism in 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 uh, before us. I mean, in in, in this, this series of registers, and of course in the space in which they were. Now, I had not previously engaged with Mukti Bodh and I had not previously been familiar with Andhere Me in any significant fashion before this happened. And one surprising benefit of working with young Piyush Kashyap was that born and raised as he was in Patna, he belonged to what I realized, I did not know this, was an entire generation that had valorized this poem as something of a formative coming of age experience. Uh, this, this impact of Andhere Me. And now, of course, as you might know, this impact that money call has on a whole, a whole generation of people. Uh, it was really interesting because uh, for Satya, what we got, and this was thanks to Uday and Vajpayee, was a DVD uh, version and we tried to do better. But Piyush Kashyap, who has never seen and, and grew up with uh, Satya Se Urta Admi, it was like a formative experience on Dere Me itself was. And the fight, that political fight that took place over Satya was for him a formative experience, was to say that this print, this very print was actually it. I mean, it had become like an original, like a master for him, you know, I mean, with, with all the scratches and all of that stuff. It, it, it had exactly that quality to, to, to his, uh, his work. Um, it had earlier happened with Kamal Sorup's Om Darbadar, which has also, I think, transgressed from being an, an experimental art house film into becoming a, a proper presence of a political counterculture in the range to which it is now seen in YouTube, for example, and the range of people who have grown up uh, watching uh, Om Darbadar, for instance. So it seemed to me that if numerous YouTube renditions of Andhere Me, which are, which are, which are present, uh, both as theatre and as poetry, together with Mukti Bodh websites, uh, which I was surprised to find so many of, or readers of, um, um, for example, you know, Kannada poets uh, in the, in the Navya tradition, or Kusumagraj in Maharashtra, uh, that, and if a bootleg print of money called Satya Se Urta Admi now joins um, you know, various European and, uh, and Asian masters as part of the essential viewing in the hard disk of a, of a film student. It does make it necessary that we revisit our modernisms and the considerably wider viewing, listening and reading publics who have lived our struggles and traumas as their own. Um, this is in conclusion. Uh, in 2013, a major curatorial achievement, uh, which I happen to see here in Delhi, titled Black Sun, Alchemy, Diaspora and Heterotopia, uh, has uh, the curator Shehzad Dawood reprising a subterranean history of precisely such speculation, circulations. He assembled an astonishing collection of artists who stood for the world's avant-garde, now coming together only because they existed in some entirely elusive circuit of making and consumption. So from Maya Deren to Nasreen Mohammadi, from the Desire Machine Collective to the Autorith Group and Aisha Abraham's reconstructions of decaying celluloid to Runa Islam's literal conversion of a moving image camera into a writing instrument, it seemed he took these artists into strange and uncharted territory uh, such a territory was both a landmass, he says, such as Greater India, that's his phrase, as well as a combination of liminal modes of consciousness that have created several states of intersection. So he talks about such intersection being the nodal points that cyberpunk um, writer William Gibson weaves into a method of trying to unpick the future. 
And this is what he now reads into these artists and this material. The title of this project of his Black Sun is of course comes directly from the very text of Kristeva that I have quoted earlier um, and used in an argument about money and the signifying trace. Dawood makes reference to a very similar trace that appears to persist in a great deal of the avant-garde practice that he is looking at. It is, I quote him, an unnameable thing, the thing being the Kristeva entity, which arises as a result of the trauma of pre-symbolic loss of the maternal object. Kristeva developed the condition of abjection, says Dawood, that is situated outside the symbolic order, where the very condition of being forced to face it is an inherently traumatic experience, as with the repulsion presented by a confrontation with filth, waste, or a corpse, an object that has been violently cast out of the cultural world, having once been a proper subject of it. From such a position, the very idea of imagining a future is at best a deeply fraught one. It has a necessary intermediary step of being cast out into the wilderness where one's faith is tested before a final resolution. Dystopia or melancholia is always on the path. As he, as he seeks to sketch an experimental history of micromodernisms, this is a term that the Desire Machine Collective uses, Sonal Jen, it's her phrase, the micromodernisms, which he talks about as temporal and spatial trajectories that seemingly mundane nevertheless exist outside any notion of a hegemonic center, Dawood harnesses his evidence freely. He is neither halted by the traditional limits of artistic originality nor by conventional boundaries of the national. So his references move from Somnath Hoare to Kandinsky and from Freddie Mercury to Yoko Ono. As he works towards what I might call with Frederick Jameson, a history of consciousness that condenses all of these into a seeming single story. If then in Iti, we took Piyu Shah's originary act of translation further, it seemed that the technical aesthetic act of moving these new works into the art museum at the Jawahar Kala Kendra found itself accompanied by another historical evacuation that was similar to Dawood's into the experiential underside of Cocteau's phrase of film being as cheap as pen and paper. Notwithstanding the clear and present danger of celluloid's demise before the triumphalism of the digital onslaught, a demise that we graphically witnessed in the film's division's decaying vaults, the Piusha and, and, and me looking at, at, in horror at the condition of those, of those negatives and positives, it seemed that there is still the hope of the cinema staying alive through a social circulation that has invigorated and continues to invigorate subaltern histories, hopes, anxieties and fears. Putting 20 years of money's engagement with the moving image into a single three-channel work within the armature of Korea's Navagraha opened up this possibility. Thank you very much. Unless you want to answer from there. Uh, well, friends, this was a brilliant presentation. Very complex. Perhaps difficult to comprehend immediately. It should reoperate in our minds. But if you have any questions or queries or comments, please ask. Raise your hand. <laughs> The first one is always difficult, then others follow. Yes, please. Wait for the mic, yes. And do utter your name. You have one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Abhishek, I'm, I'm studying at Ambedkar University. Go ahead. Um, I, it's, it's very interesting your insights and uh, Manikov's uh, thought processes of making films and approaching writing, so to say. I'm just wondering, I, I'm sure I might be misplaced. Uh, this act of de-signifying, of course, as you said, the tree is already signified even before the camera moves there and so there is a realism already. But the act of de-signifying, the wakefulness in which the tree is shot, can we say it's always going to, towards a sense of a new re-signification when at least it gets edited in a process of 
watching a dream or becoming a dream sequence and so on. So is it is it right to put the sequence like signification, uh, designification, and resignification? The utterance of the utterable is going to happen mm. anyhow. Mm. So in that sense, if I'm right putting it like that, in that sense, these works uh, that you put in the museum are they really uh, an attempt of uh, designification, so to say, or perhaps? Uh, falling more towards the resignification uh, uh, of the original what was available. In that sense, is erasure ever fully possible to do? Isn't it always falling into a new sense of uh, utterance? Yeah, perhaps it is. But uh, it it seems to me, um, just to get back on, on the very last thing you said, that there is always that possibility. Uh, and 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 therefore, it has to be. I think my next position would be that that has to be guarded against. Um, and the, the the astonishing thing is that for all that, he was not, uh, you know, uh, hugely possessive of his cinematic material after he had made the film. Uh, unlike, I mean, for example, we know. Uh, I'm sure there's many present here today, video artists who are incredibly particular about how uh, their their work can be shown and cannot be shown. Uh, and, and indeed, filmmakers used to be. Uh, I mean, I remember um, um, uh, Straub and Huey, for example. And we actually, with money, uh, met with Straub and Huey and Pezzero. Um, and, and you know, the, I mean, there, there would be other instances of filmmakers doing this. But for all that, uh, for he seemed not to be terribly worried about it as a as a practical fact. Conceptually, however, I think, and, and I must say that this exploration now has to be done. It's not something to which I have an answer and I'm thinking as I speak to you. I think that resignification would not be an idea that he would, uh, he would recommend. What he would do, I think, is that he would sort of bring it down, make it, make it function you know, within this, as I'm saying, this, 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 this set, of, set of traces. And I think, of course, there is this, uh, probably this aspect to it, um, you know, this, uh, you know, melancholic sort of aspect to it, which we might have to separately separately discuss, in order for it to become, uh, how does one put it, laterally available. You know, for it to for it to kind of circulate within a certain set of re set of registers of consciousness. As I mean, in the way that he would he would understand the word. I must put this in in quotes. And it is that connection, uh, as it now can talks to, for example, popular culture. Uh, which is of which is of interest. I mean, it's the manner in which these circulations take place, um, and 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 this this uh, as I was saying with, with Piyush Kashyap, this extraordinary rediscovery of Satyasi Utta Admi in this form, uh, which I which I think is of interest because this is a kind of a, a history of uh, if you like Indian modernism that we haven't haven't really engaged with. Uh, I, I I think you know it's 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 this this subterranean sort of uh, history. Which is which is which is I think I think of interest. So it was it was doubly of interest that we did this in Jaipur, uh, that we did this in that in that space to that that kind of audience. It was like a almost like a pact that we were making with which our audience was was coming in, rather than uh, anything of signification. I am also I take this opportunity to make this uh, interesting uh, uh, possibility that is it is it possible uh, that call is revived. In sort of uh, making a practice of cinema in a sense that called it. Uh, in, I mean, of course, these works are very interesting and they have an interesting revival of uh, uh, Paul's work. But is it possible to sort of approach cinema conceptually and thus revive him uh, in that sense hmm. of? Uh, yeah, that's right. That, that's yeah. exactly that's exactly the point. And that's that's in fact, you know, the the entire sort of the the anecdote I mentioned in the very beginning, the Thomas Elsasser's story is actually the, the way by which the art museum may engage with the cinema. Uh, that's, that's actually the, the precise possibility. But, but what its terms are, what its limits are, how does that work and not work, I think we are only in the process of exploring it as, as we go. That was happily a very good question. <laughs> but yes. Hi. Hi uh, just two snippets of uh, not really insight, but I got to know Money Call uh, quite well in uh, much later uh, when I'm in the 2001 three when he was 
I was in Amsterdam and he was there too as an advisor. Mm -hmm. So I think one of his things about deep signification, why that would not be a project for him, uh, but uh, a continuous lateral spreading would be, uh, is also perhaps um, echoed in what he would always do with all the people, uh, you when know, we were all artists at the Rikes Academy, and he would come to the studios, he would of course sing a lot of Drupal, and people would wonder what that is. But he always said, make sense, not meaning. So for him that was very really important. And the second thing is that he also turned to video, and this kind of uh, not being really bothered or being precious perhaps comes from also grappling with the reality of what he could do, uh, you know, coming to terms with that. Hmm. And the video then, he, he just sort of embraced it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say, by the way, thanks, Sonia, because uh, when we saw um, uh, the monkey's raincoat, uh, uh, this was actually, money sort of seemed to have become friendly with a bunch of uh, Riggs Academy artists who then went to the Venice Biennale and, 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 and he went, uh, right? That's the one, yeah. And, and you actually helped us identify who these people were and, and so that's become, that's a very interesting uh, um, aspect of it. Uh, I mean, it, it's kind of ironic that, you know, those of us who know Money Call will actually have people in Holland who have no idea who the man was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, to, so to take that and, you know, uh, attach his interest in this, this Chinese uh, um, performance artist who, who kept eating red chili, I mean, was, was just astonishing. I mean, and he was fascinated by that, um, it, it, it seemed. So, that was the conversation that we had had, and I, I want to work on it further uh, with you, with your help. And since there is some time, let me tell you the story of Satyasiv Tatmi. I had heard of Manikor, but I had not seen his film. And one day I get a phone call in Bhopal. I was the deputy secretary in government, looking after culture. He said, I have been reading Mukti Bodh and I want to make a film. And my friends in Delhi tell me that maybe you would be interested. I had no experience of filmmaking. I didn't even know. But the way he said it, I said, why don't you come over? We will discuss the matter and see what happens. And I went to pick him up from the airport. And on way, he started talking to me about Mukti Bodh. I used to think I was one of the authorities on Mukti Bodh. I mean, young man's fantasies. So I had written on him very soon after his death and things of that kind. So I thought I knew Mukti Bodh very well. But this conversation, which must have lasted for 35 minutes or 40 minutes, very happily disturbed me that he knew what I did not suspect existed in Mukti Bodh till then. So we started talking and this, that and the other. And I started wondering as to how. The money required was about three and a half lakhs. But three and a half lakhs is a huge money. How to find that money was, was the problem. So anyway, by the time I had some kind of a reputation in bureaucracy, so I happened to speak to one of them and he was Secretary Agriculture and nothing to do with culture. He only used to come to our concerts and things of that kind. And I told him that there was this great writer Mukti Bodh and there is this very well-known filmmaker. He wants to make a film. Now how do I find this money? He said, how much money do you require? So I said, it's, it's about three and a half lakhs or something like that. He said, look, I can help you by this. But whenever you shoot, I will have the agriculture marketing societies uh, fund it, the visit. They will provide the 
hospitality and this, that and the other, uh, etc. So that was one big help. That's how I started finally to get together mm. the money. Uh, and we kept on talking about the film. The notion in the beginning was it's going to be some kind of a, a documentary uh, about uh, Mukti Bodh. In any case, the notes that I wrote to get the money from here and there, they all described it because this was understandable that there is going to be a documentary, a major writer from Madhya Pradesh. That was the, uh, the thrust of the notes. When the film started getting made, it was obvious that it was not a documentary. It was a, it had nothing, no element of documentation at all. Uh, in fact, I don't remember even if the image of uh, a photograph of Mukti Bodh is used in the film at all. And the film was shot in all kinds of places, including an old royal palace, a kind of a Bhutha, Puthi Haveli, a Mahal in Dhar, which is a <coughs> million miles away from Rangar Gaon, where Mukti Bodh had lived at that time. Anyway, <coughs> the film got made. We had many shots which I saw being shot, which were not there in the film. Uh, till then, I had no experience, so I didn't realize that what was being shot. Four o'clock, I had the whole police constabulary come on horse, uh, horses because there was a shot to be, and there was to be told, and this, that, and the other, and kind of. Uh, 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 and uh, when they the film has very little of it. So I didn't realize this that because I didn't know how films are made. Uh, anyway, finally, when the film was shown, we had huge festival around Mukti Bodh. His complete works were being published at the same time. And the cover was done by Maniko. By the time, and Maniko had by the time convinced me that we should have a Dhrupad Kendra in Bhopal. We had nothing to do with filmmaking. He was trying to convince me and got convinced me. And I said, but where would we get some ustads? And he said, I will take a small ustad and take a small ustad. You first take it to So you know, in 1980, one of the first things that we did, apart from this film, was to create a Dhrupad Kendra, which was entirely under his shall we say, inspiration or pressure or both. And Chote Ustad and Bade Ustad came. Mani called new music. I mean, one of the things which is common between uh, Kumar Shahani and Mani Kaul was the both were insiders in music. In fact, the other film that I did, I had the dubious distinction of having produced two great filmmakers of India. One was Mani Kaul and later Kumar Shahani. And Kumar Shahani's film was made on a chanced conversation meeting on the stairs of the Jahangir Art Gallery, where he said that he wanted to make a film on how Dhrupad, rigidities of Dhrupad gave way to the freedom of Khayal. So this is how Khayal Gatha was born. He said, all right, let's do that. So in any case, to go back to Manikov. Then these agriculture mandis will host the team and a lot of shoot, shooting which was done was never used, which must be the, uh, the usual practice. I didn't know that. So uh, I had a sense that there's a lot of wastage uh, perhaps involved. This little time realized that out of this wastage, art is created. Uh, anyway, when the film was shown in Delhi, you know, Manikal never used to attend the premiere of his films. He used to avoid. He would be there for a while and disappear. So he, halfway through, he ran away. He went out. And the film has aroused very, very angry passion uh, among the leftists. 
who thought this was, and it was very interesting, the two people, two groups of people whom we fought with on this, one was the group of leftists who thought it was, Muktibodh was their property, and who the deuce is this Manikol? How can he do this? What is this? There is neither documentary nor, nor this. It was all kinds of allegations were made about it and waste of public money, of course. Uh, three and a half lakhs of public money. Uh, and the other difficulty was that Nirbal Varma, our close friend, never pardoned me for having funded that film. We fought on that film in the IIC bar at least seven times, if not more. <laughs> he never could condone my <laughs> so-called lapse. And it was there that the issue was public money. How can you uh, allow uh, a filmmaker to do what he likes with public money? There it was. So it was a very, very interesting story. And what he did, you know, I, I recall only one scene. There is a scene. You see, Mukti Bodh has a diary. Yes? Question. Huh? Oh, question. please. Question. 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 Oh, sure. I thought you, uh, of, of him. Yes. Uh, sure. statement, um, just, just staying for a minute with, with Satya, um, I mean, what's happened I think is hindsight is that uh, Satya and Mati Manas have, I think, as, 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 as film historiography uh, has, has grown, become the key money call works and, and that then is a, a specific sort of development that, I mean, you know, I'm almost sort of prescient in terms of what... Uh, you know what cinema would then go on to be, uh, and 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 how early uh, this particular idea of uh, let's say the film essay or this particular idea of the non-fiction film worked. Uski roti, uh, which was um, uh, the, the question, I had written. Uh, the, I mean, the, actually, the organizing principle of this installation was was part of the organization. Princi organizing principle was really based on a. On, on, on a long um, essay that I had written on that film where I had actually explored two things. One, the, the film's use of the grid structure. Um, you know, there was, there was um, money claimed a grid of seven distances and they would actually work like that. So it was, it was uh, let's say, three and a half feet, seven feet, 12 feet, um, which would allow him to, act, to, to work between uh, the camera and a particular sort of focal point that would then become inside the shot. That is a very early discovery for him, that the focal point would be the point at which someone would enter at some point in the film, uh, in, in, in the shot. This grid of seven distances in turn allowed him to, for example, do astonishing cuts of continuity from frontal to side on, for example, from, uh, uh, let's say, a long shot of some, some, somebody to a close up along that, along that same axis. So once we had that particular grid structure, I suggested to Piyush that this would be the potential, the structure that we would use to make that installation. Uh, that there was actually a possibility of working with some of the organizational principle of the film itself to, to do this. A second, uh, uh, I think unbeknownst to himself, Kaushik Bhaumik uh, had had something to do with that uh, aspect, was to enter the inner space of uh, Balo. 
to recognize that in a sense money seemed to have brought something to the story of uski roti that was probably not there in mohan rakesh namely the projections of balu's own inner world into uh, that was that which was around her so you know you get a point at the end of the film where you actually don't know any more whether uh, that rape happened or was it just part of a fantasy was she even there did she go to sleep when the bus was there or and and this is incredible that point at which uh, the bus goes off into the distance and you get a tight close up of her face and this incredible half smile as she looks into the distance whether she had some of the other masterminded at all you know <laughs> so there was a kind of a sense of balu being a far more important figure as her own inner projections and the world outside seemed to I- I- interact with each other so what he then did in the installation one was the organizational principle of the grid and the second was actually look at sim- this simultaneity thing that 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 he had looked at to look at certain actions in the film as working through a set of spaces so there was um, balu's own inner world which was to say to do with her sort of projective spaces the space of the sister jinda and the space in the city of the of the husband which then got split up into different sections and lastly what we had done was that because the as you know and uh, i think some friends here have been able to see that installation uh, at no point of time in the entire uh, organization of the installation space can you actually see all five screens so at any point of time ideally you can only see three screens so we had three spaces in our mind where you could see let's say screen 1 2 4 you see screen 2 3 5 and then space 3 where you could see 3 4 5 let's say or something you know so each of those spaces from where you could see it were actually split up into three parts so uh, you know there was one narrative that you could see from space 1 one, one narrative you could see from space 2 and one from space 3 so you could technically it's a 9 minute loop but really you could see it three times over based on where you stood um so those were the those were the the ideas as far as that film was concerned and of course i think that i mean there was some i mean one idea very early on um which i think had arisen even in guangzhou was that in a sense if you want to show money call or any filmmaker in uh, an art space then you might as well go the whole hog you know might as well do it all the way uh, then there's no point in trying to pretend as though you're trying to show it in its intact uh, form but to actually stay with something something else so once we decided that we were going to do this uh, then for this particular space uski roti then because of its structure of organization became probably the most appropriate uh, experiment to try it out on because extreme extreme formal rigor yeah just a minute let the mic come hello uh, my name is parivartan i'm an artist i i, I just want to mention few things about the installation Uh, it just reminded me of um, Harun Faruqi, huh, the yeah, filmmaker. Yeah. So he made documentary film for TV television. And yeah. uh, in later in his life, he was asked to do multi-channel video installation. So he writes that very interestingly how uh, it was something like for him, it was like dismantling the film and going back in time to his editing table. Hmm. And uh, what was fascinating for me while well, I was reading. two things which is like uh, in the installation form when we see film as a viewer you are kind of liberated from the spatial limitations what happens in the auditorium where you are bounded by your chair and uh, you sit and another thing is uh, the film the narrative also get liberated uh, from the duration of the film, cinematic duration of the film so narrative also like yeah. Uh, so it's more like interesting for me. So it just reminded me of Alam oh, oh, Faruqi. Yeah. yeah. But the ch- question was that who is taking those decisions? That's the uh, because Alam Faruqi took his own decision to make it multiple like seventeen, eighteen, twenty channel. But here there is someone taking that agency or whatever. Yeah. So I just want to clarify one thing, which is that at no point of time did we say we were showing Uski Roti. Eh? This is a 2017 work titled Data. made directed by piyush kashyap uh, so it's a completely new work using footage from uski roti uh, so this is this is a, a new installation that has its own existence um, iti also likewise is a new installation that has its own as as the hawa me ghat um, about this other question you know around uh, audiences coming in and going i mean i think it's really worth remembering that uh, 
this particular, you know, I'd say the industrial mode of showing films to an audience of a thousand, you know. I think it was Kumar who at one point of time said uh, that he thinks, uh, and this was actually the 1970s, uh, when it was almost inconceivable, that he'd like to show his ideal audience for showing a film was probably 30 or 40 people. Now, in an audit, see, showing a film in Bombay at that time meant showing it in Eros Theatre. There was no <laughs> other space to show it. Uh, except, uh, except, uh, I think with two uh, mini theaters that that existed, which were primarily for advertising p p purposes. So the idea that you can actually show it to a smaller audience was in itself a complete revelation. Um, the idea that you can further show films to audiences that maybe you know uh, freed up, if you like, was 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 yet another possibility, in in in, in a sense. Uh, I, I I think that I think that there is there is something. Some some possibilities there, which I think were and are worth worth uh, exploring. Any other? Well, so we come to the end of this evening. Thank you very much, Ashish, and thank you all for being there. On well, fifteenth of September, that is a month hereafter, we have the Gaitonde Memorial Lecture here. B. N. Goswami would speak on conversations with gods on the life and work of Manku of Guler. On 13th September, in Art Matters in the IIC, we have our friend Om Thanvi talking about linguist and explorer L.P. Dasitori, the Italian archaeologist and linguist, Kali Bangaka Anveshi. And on 21st September at the IIC, we have Aj Kavita. So you're all invited with similar degree of curiosity and patience. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Can you give us the script? No? I want to give it. I think you have yeah, all yeah, sent it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sent it. That's right. Uh,